that's what they do. <coughs> they build dams, you know. Yeah. Chew trees, keep their teeth up. Yeah, exactly. Nest for their babies. Okay, so um, I'm rolling, and you're, you're going to look at Jeff when you answer okay. back. Okay, great. So, um, Should I put the phone off the hook? Um, We've actually, I think in almost every interview we've done, the phones rang, so maybe it's just part of the, maybe you should just let it ring. Yeah. <laughs> so we can be consistent. <laughs> it provides a break. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you'll see when, when we're doing, when you watch these, you know, there's each one of them, you know, ring, and then Fred gets up, and, you know, I think Pam gets up, and yeah. it's pretty, it's crazy. <laughs> now, you found Fred on his houseboat, huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that was fun. And uh, we're going to try to get back there again. Oh, really? To do a few more questions and okay. also to film a few more things. Um, but pardon? To, to actually do some more filming of some of the things he wanted to show us that we didn't have time for. Oh, okay. We had to rush off for a medical appointment. Okay. Uh, but we wanted to film a few other things. You know. Okay. But, uh, all right, I guess we'll, we'll get started. And um, let me just date it. Um, this is Jeff Katz. It's... Thursday, August 27th, 2009. It's approximately 1.15 or 1.30 in the afternoon, and we're here with Jerry Thong at uh, his home, and uh, we are going to get started. So um, I'd like to start by just asking a few kind of general background questions, and then okay. we'll move closer to your years with Allied Arts, and then we'll focus on your presidency in those years, those couple of years, and um, and some of the years after that as well. Okay. Um, so first, I just would like to start by asking you, uh, when were you, when, uh, where were you born? And okay. if you don't mind sharing the information, uh, what was your date of birth? Okay. Well, I was born on March seventh, nineteen thirty-two. In uh, my parents lived at that time in Northwood, Iowa. Actually, the hospital was right across the border in Minnesota, so we, we the, the I was actually born in Albert Lee, Minnesota. And then you, uh, but you actually were living in Iowa. I lived my first two years in Northwood, Iowa, yes. And after your first two years? Uh, then we moved to Fargo, North Dakota. And I kind of grew up in Fargo, went to high school there. And then <clears throat> when I graduated from high school. Uh, my mother and I, my mother wanted to move to Seattle to start a business with her sister and who lived here. And so we drove across the country, and uh, which was uh, an, quite an experience for a flatlander, and, uh, and uh, spent a, a summer in Seattle in Magnolia, and then moved to Yakima, and uh, I I uh, went to junior college in Yakima for two years, and and then came over to the University of Washington and and uh, graduated there in 1954. And I took a couple years off with the. U.S. Army in Austria and Italy, and uh, on what we called the Army of Occupation at the time, although it wasn't hazardous duty at all. And and uh, I came back and uh, went to law school uh, back in New York in at Columbia University. Graduated there, came back to Seattle. 1959, took the bar examination in 1960, met Ernie again for a second time, about the same time, and we got married in 61. I went with a, what was then a small firm, uh, in the top of the Hogue building, uh, and uh, and uh, but the firm grew over the years. And, uh, what was the name of the firm? Well, it started out, it was Bredhorst, Fowler, Bateman, Reed, and McClure. That's a long name. Mr. Bredhorst had, was 
was dead and Mr. Fowler was dying at the time. Uh, and pretty soon the firm uh, became uh, um, Reed, McClure, Mosseri, and Thone. And then uh, when we moved to the Bank of California, a man named Chuck Moriarty joined us. And it, so it became Reed, McClure, Mosseri, Thone, and Moriarty. And uh, that, then we had a period of growth and probably had 50 or 60 lawyers at, the, at that time. Um, and then I left that firm in 1990 and joined Helsel Fetterman. And I was a partner there for 10 years. Then I retired. I'm still of counsel with Helsel Fetterman and uh, and go into the office occasionally. I don't do anything useful anymore. What, uh, a couple of questions about your practice. Um, what, did, what got you interested in law in the first place? And um, what kind of law did you practice all these? And what are you still practicing? Well, um, <clears throat> it's hard to say what got me into law. I had this, I had majored in accounting uh, in undergraduate, and somewhere along the way, I decided that accounting and me were not uh, meant for each other. And so, I thought about various things. My father uh, had been a lawyer back in North Dakota, and uh, I just uh, kind of. Uh, was inclined in that direction. So I had the uh, GI Bill available to me and I had my pick of schools and I got into a, what I thought was a good school. Um, and then my practice, my practice was mostly uh, trial work and what what they call uh, insurance defense work. We Used, often were retained by insurance companies to defend people who had done various things, um, either actually or uh, allegedly bad things, and and um, in, and that was a variety of cases. Um, I enjoyed trial work. It, um, my some of the cases involved. Well, I defended. Uh, cases brought against the Port of Seattle, and I uh, defended various uh, architects, engineers, medical people, and automobile drivers, you know. So it was quite a varied practice, and I, I enjoyed it. And then, uh, of course, uh, when, I, uh, when I retired, I quit, uh, officially retired and went off counsel, I, I quit uh, doing trial work. You know, it, it's kind of a full-time thing. And, uh, and so now what I do is uh, uh, various small things for old clients who, who, who have some kind of a problem or another and some want Wills revised that I did years ago, and and uh, some have uh, various uh, things uh, uh, happen to them that they want a consultation. So I do that, and I enjoy that. But but uh, I don't go into court anymore. Now you talk. You, you mentioned that your mom came. Your mom had a. Uh, a business that she was going to open with her sister out here. Which yes. Is what brought you to Seattle? Just curious to find out what business, what kind of business was that? Okay. Uh, uh, back in North Dakota, my mother had uh, worked uh, with a, a business called Welcome Wagon, which is a business of welcoming newcomers to a city and bringing them a basket of. Uh, th things from local businesses, hopefully tempting them to go with that business, you know, a percentage off with the local dry cleaners and 
and uh, and a you know, gift of something from the local insurance broker and you know the things like that that would and uh, and uh, so she liked that business she enjoyed it she enjoyed meeting people and so she and hers <clears throat> and uh, her sister just looked around the state of Washington uh, for a suitable size city to to start that business and they started it in Yakima and they called it um, newcomers welcome service and and um, it 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 thrived and and she uh, they eventually opened similar businesses in um, in the Kennewick and Richland and Wenatchee and Moses Lake and uh, Ephrata Othello yeah so any town that was small enough where you could get around you know easily so that's what she did that's pretty. That's pretty incredible. Did that yeah. business? Did that business last for a substantial? It time? lasted until she retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there is it is there anything similar still going on? You well, you know, I don't know. I have no idea, really. It's a good uh, idea. Well, yeah, it was a good idea, and and um, but it's, it's the, the idea is well known, you know. So so um, uh, there are various people that try to to do it and they just did it effectively and and they it's kind of a people business and uh, and uh, they both enjoyed uh, enjoyed meeting people i kept up my contact with yakima because i started when i was in uh, started in the uh, junior college there i went to work at the at the local cannery and uh, so I eventually got into kind of an accounting job there, um, I guess because I had been an accountant, and um, and that provided summer work. So every year uh, during college and during law school, I'd come back to Yakima and work uh, work in the office of the uh, California Packing Company. Del Monte is the name of the company. Yeah, and, and and so that was that was perfect because they needed me when I needed work. How was it? How was it in uh, New York going to law school there? How did you like it? Oh, I loved New York. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, it's a it's not a bad city to be a poor student in, you know, especially in those days because you could get around. The subway was like fifteen cents, and you could go wherever you wanted to go, you know, for 15 cents. And and there were uh, competitive prices. There were, I sold librettos at the, uh, at the uh, Metropolitan, the old Metropolitan, and, uh, and for selling them for 45 minutes, uh, they would give us, give us a seat up in the fifth balcony, you know, and, and so that was uh, fun. And, and uh, there was, uh, if you went down on a Friday night and stood in line, you could get standing room in most of the plays uh, for uh, a dollar or two. But you stood then behind the last row of seats. I didn't mind standing in those days, you know. So there was a lot to do. And, and, and I, of course, I enjoyed the school. It was, a, Columbia is quite a place to be. And, and Columbia at that time, uh, there was kind of a collection of, uh, well, I think you know the territory, you know, uh, on Morningside Heights, you know, was it was quite a place to be. There was Columbia, there, there was Barnard, there was the um, education uh, school, the School of Education, there was the uh, uh, Union Theological Seminary. There was the Jewish Theological Seminary. There was, there was uh, Juilliard. I mean, it was just quite a place. To, you didn't have to leave Morningside Heights to find interesting people to listen to. Did you live in the dormitory? I, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. 
Now you came. You said that you came back um, and met Bernalee for the second time. Yeah. Did, did you? Well, we. Did you, or did you guys actually meet for the first? We time? met uh, first. We met in um, in Yakima. You see, she was she was attending uh, Yakima Junior College uh, part of the time that I was, so I met her there, and uh, and uh, but we didn't really get to be close friends at that time. And then you came back and, and uh, came back, each other again? And I was, I was studying uh, for the bar exam and uh, was walking at the University District and early lived in the University District and so we happened to pass on the street. And, uh, so, she, just so that we started doing things together, yeah. That's yeah. great. Do you, have, uh, do you guys have children? We have two daughters, um, Jennifer and Jessica. Uh, Jennifer was born in 1964. Makes her, what, 45 now? Yeah, it's hard to believe. And Jessica uh, was born in 1967. Jessica lives in Italy, in, outside of Florence, and she has uh, three lovely uh, grandchildren, or children, you know, who are our grandchildren. And they usually spend the summers with us. Usually this time of year, they're out here playing on the deck. They, because when they come, they, they come for a month or two. And, uh, and so we've stayed acquainted that way. And then, of course, we go over there from time to time and visit them there. What do, what do they each do? What, what is their occupation? Well, Jennifer uh, uh, works for the uh, the feds. She works in the uh, uh, what is it? The health, social and health services for the fed federal government, and um, and uh, she is and uh, enjoying that very much and and Jessica teaches at the University of Florence teaches English and uh, and her husband is works for a bank in Florence oh Jennifer's husband is a cop and he likes that he, he enjoys doing that and uh, and could you tell us a little bit a little bit about Ernley Ernley is an artist and uh, she has uh, always been involved in the arts. She's attended uh, a lot of art classes and a lot of art uh, schools. And, and uh, she started out, I think, well doing. She's done some painting. She's done some sculpture. Um, and uh, she yeah, used to do a lot of pottery. And um, she was very good at all those things. And, but then she, she uh, in recent years, became interested in, in uh, jewelry making, uh, involving beads and, uh, and um, mostly necklaces. And uh, she enjoys doing that. She's become quite uh, successful at that. She's... Uh, she places now at the uh, in the uh, in various uh, gift shops for uh, art museums and 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 a, and a couple high end clothing stores uh, take her things and and she is also now uh, uh, going to uh, uh, place her things in the. Uh, in the art uh, museum in Palm Springs, so she she's she's busier than I am right now. Well, that's wonderful. So since we're talking about the arts, um, that's a good way to jump into our our discussion about allied arts. Okay. And um, the first thing that I wanted to find out from you was what how did you first become in in not uh, not only interested or involved with allied arts, but how did you find out about allied, allied arts? And then, 
what brought you to Allied Arts? Okay. Well, it was a, kind of a strange route. Um, I was our office was in the Hogue Building, and the and um, in those days, m most law offices didn't have a, a lunchroom or a place to make coffee or anything like that. And so, uh, the young lawyers in the building would go downstairs to ne and next door to a a uh, place called Dooley's. And where, where was the Hogue Building? What? Where is the Hogue Building? Exactly? The Hogue Building is at, uh, is at Second and Cherry. And, uh, and uh, Dooley's was right next door. The building is no longer there. Hogue Building is still there, but the Dooley's Building is gone. It replaced. Anyway, uh, so we'd have the uh, we'd have coffee with the the young lawyers and and talk about things and and I made several acquaintances there and 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 uh, over coffee which we usually kept to pretty tightly to a fifteen minute interval you know that uh, they would expect us back upstairs if we didn't get back there so. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, one of uh, the people I met there was a, a, a man named, uh, a young lawyer named Jim O'Connor. And uh, somewhere along the way he said, uh, would you be interested in uh, working on a committee? He said he was head of a committee for Allied Arts, which I'd never heard of. And he said, would you be interested in working on that committee? Uh, and the purpose of that is to um, is to try to uh, advocate underground wiring and uh, and uh, and uh, replacement of the poles with street trees, and um, and I said, oh sure, you know. So I got involved in that committee. And uh, what, what year was this? Pardon? What, about what year was this? Well, that'd be about 1964. And um, and um, the, that one thing led to another. You know, pretty soon Jim left, and and I was chair of the committee. And uh, pretty soon I met. Uh, so I started going to Allied Arts meetings and became acquainted with what it was doing and. And uh, I found it very interesting. It was a very lively group at the time, and and um, and very much of an advocate for arts in the community, and arts in the community. So, at any rate, uh, the committee at, at that time was called Operation Deadwood, and I replace that name as soon as I could I just I, I wasn't enthused about that and and I met about the same time a, a wonderful man uh, by the name of Jack Robertson Jack Robertson was uh, head of the applied physics department at the University of uh, Washington which meant that in his business time he was helping the Navy make torpedoes <laughs> and uh, and um, but uh, the rest of his time he was a avid a Democrat and he and uh, and, and civic uh, promoter and he was he was uh, the leader he was head of the roadside council uh, which was promoting uh, control billboard control at the time. All these were radical ideas, you know, at the time. And, uh, and so Jack and I got acquainted and he and he and I uh, co cooperated and, and plus a committee, a small committee, uh, in trying to uh, uh, draft a, a plan to persuade Seattle City Light to underground some of its power structure. And uh, there was a uh, at that time, we'd just come out of a time uh, when uh, 
when there had been a dual electrical system in the city of Seattle or parts of the city. Puget Sound Power was here and and the City Light was here. And they were competing, sort of. And uh, as to uh, as to territory, and and uh, and uh, eventually, City Light won the battle. But it, for a while, there were there might be poles of Puget Power on one side of the street and poles of City Light on the other side of the street. And uh, there was a there was a wonderful man from uh, Northwest Bell who said. Uh, said that Seattle had the most uh, cluttered uh, wire and pole superstructure of any place in the country. So anyway, so uh, so we worked on a, on a plan and we developed a, uh, an ordinance. We had to first of all, it got pretty interesting because uh, we had to first of all uh, find out uh, why City Light wasn't doing any undergrounding at the time. And City Light was not only not doing much undergrounding, uh, but they were, they, were, uh, they were not cooperating with the neighborhoods that wanted to do undergrounding. So, so uh, we, we started meeting with City Light, Jack and I, and, and a couple other people. And uh, we started examining their books, and we we found that uh, City Light was uh, virtually an uh, uh, empire onto its own at that time. It was supposed to be run by the city council, but the city council just didn't have time or interest in getting involved. And, and City Light was doing great, you know. City Light was providing all the electricity the only time City Light ever came before the council was to lower the 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 electrical rates. There had been no raises since about 1920. Every year, every few years, they'd come in and lower them and lower them because they had all this hydropower. And so we had very modest uh, 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 electric rates and uh, and a good stand and good performance. So nobody wanted to touch it. Well, Jack and I kind of did burrowed in, and and we found that that they were running it like a, like their own fiefdom, you know, and uh, and it was just the management of City Light, and uh, and they did what they wanted to do, and uh, and uh, and uh, City Council wouldn't touch them, so we we started looking at their some of their policies. And they were <clears throat> very conservatively run. They they accumulated large cash reserves. When they built the boundary dam over by Spokane, they had enough cash reserves to pay for half of it before they broke ground. You know, it was amazing. And um, and uh, we thought that a modest uh, portion of these of uh, these funds could be diverted into um, into uh, into uh, uh, some plant improvement. And uh, we eventually drafted an ordinance uh, and that said that City Light should, should do uh, uh, a certain number, a certain, spend a certain number of dollars, as I recall, maybe two or three million dollars a year undergrounding uh, arterials, and uh, and uh, that their policy against uh, w in regard to neighborhoods that wanted to do uh, public utility districts um, or local improvement districts is what they were called uh, should be uh, they should uh, cooperate with them and and city light since they would get a brand new plant should pay. 50% of the cost and the neighborhood should pay 50% of the cost and and City Light resisted all this very greatly and uh, but um, but we got it passed and uh, and then that was uh, uh, 
the start of an underground program. Um, it, it didn't survive too long, you know. It 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 went on for a few years, but eventually the energy issues uh, caught up with it, and uh, and the and it kind of fell by the wayside. But probably for four or five years there, uh, we had a pretty good uh, program going. And that took up a, a lot of your a lot of your work with Allied Arts. I know that you were involved with underground wiring for. Quite, quite some time. Yeah, it took a lot. It took a lot of time. It, it got to be. A, it got. To be. You know, I think I'd like a glass of water. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and feel free to drink whatever whatever you feel like it. No, all right. Yeah. Well, I've got one here. Oh. Okay. So at one point. Uh, 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 we were trying to combine our um, uh, underground wiring with street tree improvements, and and at the same time there was a, a federal program called Urban Arterial Program, which happened to coincide, and also about this time um, some of the uh, some of the poverty programs. Uh, uh, had some money to put into underground wiring, so, so, um, or just neighborhood improvement, and uh, and uh, some of the work programs uh, uh, were there to help uh, uh, hire uh, people without much job experience to work on street tree planting so so we tried to get all those things going and, and uh, there was a lot happening and I remember at one time uh, we, I got a, we got a call from uh, um, Wes Ullman who was mayor at the time and uh, Wes said he wanted to see Jack and me in his office uh, in the next few days or something. I said, oh, okay. So we went up there, and he we, he took us into his conference room. He had a big map of the city of Seattle spread out on it, and he said, well, now you've passed this damn underground wiring ordinance. Now where am I going to put them? You know, where are we going to... Where are we going to spend that money? And uh, so we sat there and looked at the map and, and uh, kind of said, "Well, we'll do this, and we'll let's this and this and this." Well, of course, Wes was a consummate politician, and and he wanted to be sure that it was divided equally in the various quadrants of the city. So it just turned out there was one here in northeast, as it happens. The street right in front of us here, the uh, 35th. So that became a that became an urban arterial street, and uh, and uh, so we got gutters and sidewalks and and uh, street trees and and no wires. You see, it's one it's, and it's it's a beautiful street. I don't know if you if you noticed. Uh, Did you remember the street when you moved here? <laughs> What? Did you remember that this was the street when you moved here? Well, no, I, you know, I, I, I didn't really think of it, you know, but uh, that because it would, had been long ago. But the, by now the trees were mature, and then I realized that was one of our designated streets. But there was also one in Rainier Valley and Ballard, and one in uh, in West Seattle. So, so they. Uh, it was kind of uh, interesting times, and and we got some things going there. So, and also I became acquainted with Jack Robertson, and and got somewhat involved in the in the um, uh, in the billboard battle as well. And in fact, I eventually became uh, vice president of the uh, roadside council. Didn't, didn't do that for long, but they were carrying on a major battle of their own on the on the on the 
billboards, and that was a whole other site. Uh, there, uh, there were billboard issues here in the city of Seattle. There were billboard issues at the state level, and there were billboard issues at the at the national level. And of course, Lady Bird Johnson helped helped um, see to it that uh, that there were no going to be no billboards on the uh, on the new interstate highway program. And uh, so, uh, and Jack was truly a wonderful person, and uh, and he and I were uh, were friends, and we worked on projects uh, uh, for many years. Yeah. The timing was great. Pardon? The, the timing seems to have been great yeah. as far as the billboards are concerned. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. And the city beautification. Yeah. Well, you know, we th all thought we could do do something, you see, at that time. We and uh, so so we tried. Now, what was when you came into Allied Arts? What was the um, what was it like in Allied Arts, and how what was the city's perception of Allied Arts at that point? What kind of a role did Allied Arts play in general in the city? Well. It, it, it's hard for me to see it in uh, in in that perspective. Um, I found Allied Arts to be a very exciting uh, place, you know, and and uh, there were lots of uh, Allied Arts, as you know, had started as a kind of an umbrella organization for other arts organizations and uh, and and uh, allied arts originally was there to try to promote the idea of a of a regional theater and a and a viable symphony and of and a viable opera program and and a viable city center and all those things uh, and and so, the as these organizations were formed, usually they became members of Allied Arts, sometimes individually and sometimes as uh, as um, organizations. You know, so it was a uh, you know, but as as time went, so so it was in a very exciting time, and I'd say as I got involved, it was kind of beginning to transition away from that to an extent. It was still a, it was still a very um, a busy and exciting time and we tried to do everything. But, um, um, but uh, in the meantime, the symphony had grown and had its own public relations staff and its own promotion activities and and it hardly it didn't need to ride on the back of allied arts anymore you know and the same was true of theater and and opera and and so forth these these organizations which had just been fledgling organizations struggling organizations had all grown and had their own agendas and their own thing to do. So I think that kind they kind of gradually drifted away from Allied Arts, not because of any antagonism, but simply because they, they, they did their own thing after a while. But when I, when I you know, shortly after uh, we finished our underground wiring program, then they, they um, asked me to be president of Allied Arts, and I hadn't expected that. I was completely surprised at that and uh, and um, that was 1968 but eventually I agreed to do it and and I, I I felt I was too young you know and inexperienced to do it at the time and maybe I was you know but but the uh, but I went around and uh, had lunch with uh, all of the uh, Prior presidents of Allied Arts that I could uh, I could find, and uh, asked them what Allied Arts did or should be doing, you know, 
and they all had very different stories, you know. Everybody had a different perspective, you know. When, where I remember Ralph Potts saying, well, you know, what Allied Artists needs to do is encourage public fountains, you know. And so that, that's fine, you know. And, and others did, others had different and uh, perspectives. And, and so I thought, well, I guess Allied Arts really is is a chameleon, you know. It sort of changes as times change and as presidents change and as boards change and it be, and becomes a little different, you know. And I think I think maybe in in my time, Allied Arts was uh, more focused on uh, on urban beautification and and uh, and the role of the city in the in the arts uh, in the arts uh, community. So. Um, so I think that's what we tended to concentrate on. Now I'm going to focus a lot on your presidency um, and uh, some of the many things that you accomplished during those two years. And, and I've got a, a long list of accomplishments. So really? It's, it's, it was pretty impressive. I've but, probably forgotten half of them. Well, maybe this will remind you. <laughs> but um, I wanted to, you know, you're talking about talking with some of the presidents when you came in to Allied, when you became, before you became president and then when you became president to get a sense. And I want to take it back just a little bit. Um, what was your experience like with those couple of presidents that came right before you? And I think that was um, Ibsen, Nelson, and Norm Johnston. Yes. What was your experience with them like? Well, of course, those were the ones I knew best, you know, from, just from going to meetings. And uh, and the and the board meetings uh, in those days were uh, really wonderfully exciting experiences. You know, I mean, they were they were covered everything that was. It seemed to me everything that was going on, of importance that was going on in the city. You know, and uh, all the people were there who I only read about in the newspapers and stuff. So. Like, like who? Who were some of the people that were at those? Well, you know, I happen to have a list. You know, I, I, because when I took over, uh, I, I this is our this was our first uh, letterhead, and uh, if you have a if if you'd like, I can tell you some of the people who sure, were. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of th this is my first year. And uh, and uh, uh, on the uh, immediate board were uh, was uh, Richard Cornwell, who was a PR person for the symphony. Uh, Jim O'Connor was back as legal counsel, who my old the guy who led me down this trail in the first place. Bob Block, John Conway, Norm Johnston, Ibsen Nelson, ex officio. Okay, on the board of trustees, Ralph Anderson, uh, Ruth Anna Boris, who is a, quite a figure in the dance, uh, Betty Bowen, who is quite a figure in the in the arts community, Al Bumgardner, wonderful architect, Arnie Bystrom, another wonderful architect, uh, Peter Donnelly, who later became prominent in the arts. Uh, um, well, it's just uh, Peggy Goldberg, Rich Haig, Peggy Bill Holm, who was uh, became a notice notable for the uh, his work with the Indians and Indian culture. Um, Joselle Nankung. Uh, absolutely a, a, a famous, uh, became famous uh, a photographer uh, and was uh, Ruth Nomura who started the the uh, Northwest Crafts uh, Center and the in the city center 
uh, Dixie Lee Ray, who later became governor, Cecilia Schultz, who was a who was a promoter uh, of uh, of art groups in the in the city, uh, Victor Steinbrook, D. Tarzan, who was a critic for the uh, Times. Uh, Norm Worsinski, a notable uh, designer, and Alice Rooney. I mean, that's just a few of from the list. But you know, these were formidable people, and uh, they were all interested in the arts and the arts community and what we were doing, you know. And, and so uh, they were fun to work with. But you asked about Ibsen and, and, and Norm. Yes. Um, Ibsen, of course, was uh, was the president when I first started going to meetings, and I was in, tremendously impressed with Ibsen. You know, I I thought he ran the best meeting I'd ever seen. You know, he he was calm and uh, forceful, polite. Uh, he kept things moving. And he, but he saw that everybody was heard, and he would arrive at a consensus and a sense of direction, and then move on. And he, but he would, but the main thing was, he never got excited. You know, he was always calm, always polite, and things just uh, moved very smoothly. And I thought, I always. Uh, um, uh, emulated him when I could in, in the running of a meeting. I thought he was the best. Uh, and if I could even come close to his style, I would, uh, I would want to do so. Um, Norm was, uh, was, uh, Norm Johnston was, uh, also a very interesting person. He, and, and, uh, he, he was a uh, very knowledgeable and he is, uh, his field was uh, 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 was history, I think, and and uh, and urban design, and and uh, Norm. Uh, his the meetings were always enjoyable because he had a dry wit. Um, I hope he still has it. You know where uh, where he he there were just. Uh, a hundred things in the course of me that would make you smile, you know, um, that he would just he would just do this and do that, and and but he also was very tactful in the way he handled people and uh, and and polite and moved things along. So, I I thought they were uh, I was I was lucky to have those two to to uh, study for a few years before I was had the responsibility. Now, Norm, um, during his time, he seemed to be very interested in expanding Allied Arts uh, reach to some of the communities that weren't maybe being touched at that point, the minority communities in the city and also the lower income communities. Um, and and I, it seems like when you were president, you were very interested in, in broadening Allied Arts as well. Yeah. So I'm just wondering... Um, if you could talk about that a little bit. Norm okay. Norm, yeah, Norm was, uh, there's always the risk, uh, you know, when you have uh, a, a powerful board like this, that they, that they're, they're mostly, they're mostly white people talking to themselves, you know, and, um, and, um, and prominent people talking to other prominent people, you know, and, and there was a need to uh, to to broaden the uh, uh, the, the, the the perspective of 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 Allied Arts, and um, and Norm was very good at that. I recall at one meeting, at that uh, at that time, uh, oh, it's a the story doesn't have much to it, but I. At that time, there there was a movement in Italy. Uh, the, Italy had had a very staid uh, right wing uh, go government for many years, and and uh, 
and uh, they they had elected a premier who who was going to open it to to the left and so they called it the apertura a sinistra the opening to the left so i accused i said norm i said i'm tempted to say you are your approach is uh, Let's see, I see. What? How did I put it? You are having. Oh, I might. I said I might. One might want to say uh, that you have the uh, apertura a sinistra in Seattle, and he said, "Well, I hope one wouldn't say that." You know, <laughs> something like that. Some norm comment. Yeah, he definitely was trying to broaden the. Perspective and bring in people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds uh, into the arts. Focus our attention on uh, on different ethnic backgrounds, and uh, and uh, and he did that. Uh, I, th I thought quite well. Now you, um, I, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, uh, but and I'm going to come back again. But speaking of you know, speaking of what Norm did, and and then what you did, there was a, a Congress that that took place during your presidency, and I think that was 1969, which was the Arts Who Cares uh, conference, and um, I think Agnes DeMille was the keynote speaker, yes. and you had quite an array of uh, special guests, and that was really demonstrating the, bro the breadth of Seattle, and I'm just yeah. wondering, since we're on the subject, if you could talk about that con Congress a little bit, if you remember that. Well, yeah, well, that's I. There, I probably don't have too much I can say about that. Uh, I remember it well, and I mean I remember it, um, and and we were trying to just get discussions going on on various different things. Did we have a did we have an agenda for that Congress? Did did one? Have you seen such a thing? It does exist. Yes. Yeah. I'd be interested in seeing that because, well, in fact, wait a minute, there's a little bit here. There's a little bit here. Uh, in, in, bless. in some of the archives, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about just the, uh, uh -huh. the adventure of getting Agnes DeMille to come in the first place. And some of the people that you, I mean, some of the, the groups that you had there were... Um, the Seattle Youth Symphony, and uh, there was an African American fashion show uh, from the Zebra Boutique that was there, and um, you gave free tours of the Art of Tibet exhibit at Sam, um, etc. So there was a lot of uh, okay broad view of the arts and, and Seattle arts as well. What and uh, what I remember about that me meeting. <laughs> is, is that Agnes DeMille arrived very, very late. She had been up in, uh, she'd been up in Vancouver or something and giving a talk, and there was a delay in getting away from there. Either the plane flight or the driving or something had, um, had made it difficult for her to get down to Seattle. And uh, so she arrived quite late you know we thought we were going to be without our keynote uh, speaker and then and then she gave an interesting talk you know but by that time it was getting very late in the evening i mean it must have been midnight you know uh or certainly after 11 it was it was and we were losing people and and stuff so so and when the when the program was over Everybody was ready to adjourn right away, and it fell to Ernie and me to take uh, uh, Miss DeMille uh, back to her hotel because there, she had no other transportation. So, so uh, she and I, Ernie, yeah. did Agnes DeMille have a friend with her at the time, a kind of a traveling companion? Not, no, I don't know. It was just her. Know. Yeah, so we drove downtown. And um, at midnight, Seattle was pretty well closed in the evenings in those days, you know. And and uh, and 
and and we came to the Olympic Hotel, which was quite dark, and we, I think we kind of went to the wrong entrance. We went to the what's now the main entrance instead of when we should have gone to the other side. And we went in there with Miss DeMille and her and her baggage, and and we had to hunt for. Uh, there was nobody to greet us at the door whatsoever, and and we had to uh, kind of hunt around and until we found a way to get upstairs and uh, to the reception desk, you know, we finally got her. But she remained calm and uh, charming throughout. She was a very nice lady, but I thought, gee, that's not a very good impression to give Seattle to be kind of wandering around in this dark hotel, not knowing where we were going. <laughs> anyway, that's what... That's about all I remember about that meeting. Well, we'll come. Let's let's come back then to um, the beginning of your presidency. And I'm okay. just curious to find out what it was like to be approached. How did you get approached to become president? Who who approached you, and what was that process like? Well, I think it was. Uh, I believe it was Peggy and Shirley uh, who approached me. Now, what were you doing before that at Allied Arts? Were you, you were the counsel to the corporation, is that right? No, I was just chair of the underground wiring committee, you see, so I had to report. Well, they were all pleased, you know, that, that they were all pleased that we could actually get something introduced and passed in the, uh, and, you know, it, 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 that wasn't easy, and, and, uh, and uh, in those days, we could we could fill the council chambers with uh, people. You know, we we just put out the word, and we would could get we could get lots of people out there between Jack's group and our group, and uh, and some of the other groups that were sponsoring it with us. And uh, so, I when they approached me, and when, when Shirley and Peggy. Uh, said, you know, asked me to be president, you know, my first reaction was, it's too soon, you know, I'm, I really don't know enough uh, about the organization or about the, the city even to, to tackle something like this. And, but, you know, they're persuasive and, uh, and I, I talked it over with my partners and, and uh, probably talked it over with Jack. And uh, and uh, finally decided. Well, we better. I better do it. Yeah. So I did. Now, your first year as president, I think uh, Joe Sherson was your vice president. Yes. And he was with Allied Arts since the very beginning. That's right. So, uh, could you talk a little bit about that experience with Joe? Well, Joe was Joe was truly a wonderful person, and. Uh, and uh, he uh, he was a display uh, head of display for uh, Frederick and Nelson, which was in those days a first-rate uh, display uh, operation. You know, I mean, it, there was it, it was not amateurish at all. It was very professional and very effective and uh, very creative. And Joe, I think, was responsible for that, and uh, and he he was very faithful to Allied Arts. He would come to all the meetings, and he was always helpful, and uh, he always had uh, constructive things to say if people if there was a if there was a dispute going on or a disagreement going on of some kind, you know, Joe would always. We'd always wait for, for Joe to to talk, you know, because he he usually had a perspective and a uh, and a persuasive uh, viewpoint, you know. So Joe Joe was uh, he was he was one, you know. I think about Allied Arts and at this stage, you know, and I think back about uh, one of the wonderful things about Allied Arts. Uh, was the was the really good and competent and uh, 
and interesting people you you would meet in that organization. Uh, it was just full of them, you know, and, and Joe was certainly one. Yeah. What about John Conway? Did you have any contact with him? Much less. Uh, um, John was uh, was I would say colorful, colorful, and uh, and uh, he was also you know very accomplished. He he really uh, he they said he was responsible for the uh, for the theater uh, on campus at that time. There were at least three theaters on campus or immediately off campus <coughs> and and because uh, Seattle had no had no uh, uh, professional theater at the time there was there was at the the Cirque was just beginning over on Union which was a dinner theater and uh, other than that, you know, the, there was nothing else, and except the except the uh, university theaters. And John <coughs> was very instrumental in keeping those operating. And he was a nice guy to work with. He, of course, he he was always uh, he was a good friend of James Beard, so he was uh, he he was, uh, often was. We were trying to arrange through him to get James Beard to come and hold a uh, hold a fundraiser. We were always looking for fundraisers. We kind of moved from one party to the next, you know, uh, because uh, we had no other source of income except our parties. And so it was meetings and parties. 